How's it going, everybody? My name is Christopher, this is Leighton, and this is the Ustazen Show. Today, we're talking about socialization in our socialization series, part one, socializing your dog to other dogs. But first, a few words from our sponsors. So, of course, our main sponsor is Partners Dog Training School. It's an awesome place. If you haven't been here, you've got to try and make a chance, uh, try and make a, a plan to come visit us. Uh, we do everything from obedience training to behavioral training and to sport training and our new doggy daycare center is yep. almost almost done we're waiting on the last fencing to arrive yep. and we'll have that ready to go as well shortly yeah it's awesome and if you aren't in arizona if you're not able to come visit us directly here at partners dog training school then uh check us out online we have a online ai dog trainer basically you message it you tell it about your dog and then it creates behavioral uh or sorry creates personalized curriculums based on your dog's behaviors um really really in depth basically we took the experience that we've had over the past 20 years put it inside a really nice package for you guys uh to get training and uh yeah so go check that out it's called hey ludwig h-e-y-l-u-d-w-i-g on facebook messenger or heyludwig.com you can check out partners at partnersdogs.com we got a bunch of new stuff coming down the line for both our current and future clients so really excited about that but now the top of the show socializing your dog to other dogs and uh the real crucial thing about this is that your socialization time should start the minute that you get your dog so the, if you have a puppy the minute you get your puppy you should start you know finding ways to socialization to, to show, socialize them with either your home or with maybe your other pets maybe with your children creating really really safe and positive environments that you can um train your dog in is really the the what socialization is all about so uh talking about basically puppies how would you socialize so you just got a new puppy from from you know the rescue or the store um whatever it may be from a breeder and you have to you know socialize them with maybe some other pets that you have in the home so how do you make that introduction right from the beginning well socialization is not all as complicated as it might sound basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to introduce them to things that you approve of so it's the same thing as you would do with a young child or even with a child that you bring into home in a blended family situation, mm -hmm. you want to show them what's acceptable, show them what's not acceptable, introduce them gradually, step by step, to good things. Um, you know, if you look back towards the way dogs were raised, they're raised uh, by the bitch, obviously by the mother. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the the way you can test puppies as well, because it's kind of part of this whole socialization thing. And I've got a really cool story to tell you about Wendy Volhard's testing system. But if you think about, you know, the way that pups are raised by the mother, by the bitch in the wild, when she has a litter of puppies, she wants to gradually sure expose them to some surroundings and some things and so forth. Um, you know, noises, uh, interaction with, uh, with various smells, because remember, obviously, puppies are blind when they are born. And so smells and tactile, that's touch, all those things are important to, yep. uh, to gradually introduce them to. And, and when you're introducing it to, to other dogs or really any type of situation that you have to socialize your dog um, into, it's really important to go really gradual and make it a really, really positive experience. Because if you don't, you run the risk of then creating that negative association to whatever you were trying to socialize them to. And of course, that can have um, a ton of you know, behavioral issues that can that can come down the line because of that. So uh, making it a gradual process, if you have multiple dogs in the home, maybe starting off with, with a dog that's a little bit more uh, docile, a little bit more calm, and introducing them slowly. You can even take it in such a way, I, I know I was actually talking to um, my barber the other day, and uh, she was basically describing how her dog, not aggressive or reactive in any way, but really just a high energy dog that likes to play with other dogs and typically, you know, because he plays so rough, that can, you know, start things and, and so forth. And so what she runs into is that she'll be fine and obedient or that her dog will be fine and obedient when there's no other dogs around. But the second they second they go into an environment where there are other dogs around, such as maybe they're at a park or maybe they're walking down the street, then all of a sudden the dog goes and focuses really, really heavily on um, the other dog that's around them and because of that obviously then doesn't want to listen to her and so it's important to um, to create an environment that is going to be positive for that but like I said in a gradual way so maybe in her case she can start I'm just adjusting the volume here because I want to make sure that uh, everyone can hear us well enough uh, so test it uh, if you guys you know if you guys are listening in comment I just changed the volume now so it should be a little bit better it's a little bit uh, clearer from your uh, from your guys' side, so um, going back again to the the training part, if uh, 
you know, if she's working in a setting where there's another dog, maybe that gradual introduction, this could take over a couple of weeks. It could take a couple of days. It could be in just a few minutes, depending on the level of energy of the dog and, and how effective she is in training. Um, what she should do is start where the dog's maybe just in the same environment and make sure that her control is at like a level eight in that environment and then start slowly introducing the other dog maybe closer so that they're within 10, 15 feet and then try to get that same level of control within that um, within that range. And then maybe they're doing a uh, introduction where it's just the parents or the, the owners that are interacting with each other. And then you want to make sure that your dog's at a, at a level eight of obedience and control in that environment. And then after that, you can maybe make a direct introduction with another dog. So this would apply both in your family setting as well as maybe any new dogs you might come across. Again, always wanting to make sure that the other dogs that you're interacting with have vaccinations, um, that they are friendly dogs, because obviously you don't want to, again, set your dog up for failure by introducing them to another dog that might be reactive on some sort of thing, some sort of level, trigger a fight, and then that creates a negative association in your dog's mind. So taking all those things into account, I know it's a lot, but that is the advantage of going to a professional whether it's a, a school, whether it's another trainer, whether it's going to group classes and working in that environment, that's a really, really huge benefit in working in a more controlled environment to to kind of practice some of those things. And again, you don't want to be practicing um, guarding against reactive reactivity in those environments because that's not going to be the most conducive environment to kind of change that behavior. But when you're making that initial socialization, then it is uh, pretty beneficial. And obviously, when we're talking about this, we also want to talk about flooding. So flooding is kind of what you see on TV. Uh, Cesar Milan, the trainer that you often yep. see on uh, Discovery, yep. is famous for that. Um, to be honest, he doesn't flood as much as it appears. It's kind of a TV show, and so they do things that, that I'm sure that they don't really do in real life. But uh, the way that yep. flooding works is, is if you expose a dog or a person immediately to a heavy input of something, we call that flooding, and that's a bad thing. Uh, for example, if somebody was scared of a snake, you don't want to drop a snake on their lap and kind of say, hey, suck it up and deal, because that's not a, a really good way to do uh, exposure to that. So the same thing happens with socialization. When you take your dogs out, a lot of times when we're on the range, we'll see people bringing their dogs out. They want to expose them to gunfire. Or if I see people out in the street, they want to expose their dogs to cars. Don't overdo it. Do it in a gradual step-by-step -step process. Analyze the way that the dog is responding to that. Right. And then adjust yeah. your training accordingly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if you don't, so I know the a big thing that comes up with us is that if uh, still way too low, I know it can. Sorry, we're just kind of looking at, at microphone levels here. Um, I know that a big thing that we get from clients when they want to bring their puppies into like a puppy and me type class, um, they what happens is that because they have to wait until their dogs are 20 weeks old, have all their vaccinations, which is usually completed by about 16 weeks, um, then when they bring their dogs in, they say that they miss that that really crucial point of socialization, which is partly true. Now it's still, you know, you can still get really, really quality socialization even at the 20 week plus mark. Um, but if you if you really want to hit those points and make sure that you're still getting um, you know quality socialization with your dog and with your puppy at that stage, then you can always use you know family dogs like I said, or maybe friends, other dogs that uh, that have dogs that are both friendly as well as vaccinated well, um, because you definitely don't want to increase risks of of health and so forth um, into that situation. So you can still find other avenues in terms of getting that socialization. It just does help when you do get to the point of being able to go to a professional facility, um, being able to socialize in that environment because they have a lot of different breeds they make sure that all the dogs are vaccinated or at least they should um, and you can and create a really positive aspect there with other instructors and trainers that know what to uh, to look for and, and how to make that proper socialization all right so uh, let's talk a little bit about testing puppies and, and getting them ready for socialization so there's a test out there called the wendy volhard or the volhard test it's actually jack and wendy well, they actually uh, are acquaintances of mine. I haven't seen them for a few years, but they came up with a program back in the 50s and 60s. It was actually designed for the guide dog schools and in which they tested uh, how to look at the different signs of, of a puppy and to test the socialization skills of that particular puppy. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's quite a detailed thing, but if you want to look it up online, it's the Volhard testing. Um, the couple of tests are social interaction. That's obviously what we're dealing with now. They suggest testing at around 49, 50 days. Uh, the reason for that is because the puppy's mind or brain has been developed to that of a young adult. And so therefore your tests are actually fairly meaningful 
after that there's too many other factors that that will change the results now obviously that's testing of puppies we're talking about socialization here tonight but it kind of goes hand in hand a lot of times when people select a dog for themselves they don't put enough work into the selection process and they end up with a dog that is poorly socialized and then ends up being insecure or has resentful issues or is uh, nervous or uh, scared around people um, I was talking to a trainer, a couple, actually a client the other day, a couple of days ago, and we were going through this whole thing of selecting a dog for personal protection training, and they were saying that their dog is, is uh, triggering uh, certain responses. I'm trying to not get into too much detail here, but again, it goes back to the selection of the dog and the socialization skills of that particular dog. Yep. Um, just breaking away real fast, see we've got a bunch of people that have joined in. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate having you on board. Uh, shoot us a couple of comments. Let us know. Hopefully, you can hear us clearly. We have upped our, our levels here a little bit. And uh, well, tonight, we're talking about socialization. Socialization, um, other dogs. Really important yeah. skill uh, for your dogs and for you guys. It actually works well on people as well. Um, and uh, it's something you've all got to do. Um, it doesn't matter how old the dog is. Let's talk about rescues for a second. So well, let's say we and, get a, just a rescue. In, along those lines, because uh, I know I think, I think that's where you're going with it. If you So just to kind of set up this next part. What happens if you have a dog that maybe wasn't properly socialized when they were younger and now are either playing too rough or maybe they're reactive to other dogs, um, especially in certain situations? So how do you how do you approach that? And that's a pretty common thing with rescues because rescues usually are getting a little bit older. They haven't right. had that proper socialization. Right. Um, and so there's still ways to get to get through it but let's hear how we can go and, and that. not just rescues but if you buy a dog from a breeder and i just see that martin romeo joined us as well hi martin martin is actually one of the breeders that bred uh, many of the dogs that i've trained over the years and she also bred Karnak, my belgian malinois so it's great to to see you online here with us martin so so it's also when you're selecting a dog from a breeder um, if you have a dog that's come to you and you're not quite sure what it is, uh, what type of personality is it showing, then run it through a few of those tests, the tests we just talked about, kind of develop a, a um, kind of like a profile of your dog. And, and what you're looking for is how does your dog react to strange sounds? How does your dog react to being put under a little bit of pressure? Uh, there was a test, and I was trying to think of it here, we used a few years ago. Um, it was called the American behavioral temperament test i believe it was uh, abta we might be able to look it up i haven't used it for a while but they had some really um yeah let's have a look and see if you can see it there a really clever testing system where they would have like you'd open an umbrella towards your dog and you'd read the response of how the dog would behave to that particular exposure in other words you're looking for what does my dog do if i expose them to something right so it could be a sound it could be a uh, american temperament test yep society. that's it american temperament Test Society. Um, have a look if you can find their test, and we'll talk about that for real uh, for a second. Um, now, the advantage of this testing is that it'll determine a little bit more about your dog's socialization skill level, and then you can uh, see what you need to address. So, if you're asking yourself, "Well, my dog does this," then I need to do that to improve that, right? So it's the same as people. If we're talking about our sport that we, we compete in, or if you're talking about just general skills and you want to get better in something, we all know the, the general thing is to, you know, the subjects you did at school, let's say you had four or five subjects, you'd focus your time on the subjects you enjoyed the most, right? Well, the problem is that you need to kind of be an all-around person, and so therefore it's important to focus on the things that you're poorly, poor at. And temperament testing allows you to do that. Uh, so you don't have to get really detailed in it. You would basically just look at a couple of the tests and see what you need and then go from there. Now, yep. um, what I was really getting at is, do you want to talk about the classes? Well, and yeah, and so the American, just real quick, the American uh, Temperament Test Society focuses on, and this is from their website, focuses on and measures different aspects of temperament, such as stability, shyness, aggressiveness, friendliness, as well as the dog's instinct for protectiveness towards its handler and or self-preservation in the face of a threat. Uh, the test is designed for the betterment of all dog breeds and takes into consideration each breed's inherent tendencies. Yeah, and I'd, I'd forgotten that it's actually a test that they use a lot for protection dogs, uh, but you can use it a lot in other types of, of breeds yep. as well, and they have a really good graphic uh, on yeah, the basically like a list of all the different dogs, what their uh, what their percentages are of how many they tested, how many passed their test, how many failed the test, and uh, and so forth. So, um, you know, interesting stuff. What so the classes um, when we do our puppy me class we focus on socialization of a number of different things but obviously puppy socialization is part of it um, especially even in our daycare when we when we do socialize because obviously daycare is basically all socialization and if you're trying to get socialization with your dog 
again, not addressing reactivity because that's done in different manners, um, but addressing socialization, then daycare is a really, really good environment to do that in as long as the people that you're that are in the daycare are trained and know how to address that type of behavior, which obviously, you know, something that we focus on a lot here. So um, making sure that if you do go to a different daycare besides ours, that they are trained to recognize what appropriate play looks like, how to implement that into a situation. And uh, that's really, really crucial because a lot of times a, a dog might be playing with another dog and they might make sounds like they're growling or that they're acting aggressive. Yeah. And in actuality, that's just how they're playing. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with that. Now, when it gets to a point of maybe a little bit a line in the sand that you have to draw and it goes past that point, um, then obviously you want to step in and make sure that you're addressing those in those situations. Um, but you know, a little bit of rough play is not necessarily, and really any type of rough play is really in their instincts, but it's just a matter of what we deem is appropriate. Um, and that's, that can be kind of dif differentiated between each person. Uh, so going into our group classes, we, like I said, we focus heavily on the dog socialization. We also socialize them, socialize them with uh, different sounds, different types of sensations, such as walking them on concrete or grass. It was really interesting because this past uh, week we did Easter photos for all the dogs, both here in training, as well as some people from the outside. And one of the things that uh, was kind of cool to see is that the type of mat that we had that we were shooting against on a backdrop uh, was like kind of a plastic, but it was made to look like grass. And what happened is that when the dogs would walk up, they would walk on the grass fine, but the second they got to that kind of plastic sensation, they were all of a sudden a lot more freaked out. And then combine that with the fact of the wind was blowing a little bit, and so the, the mat was kind of... Um, uh, mm -hmm. moving and, and pushing against them. That was a really, really new thing for a lot of those dogs. And so uh, a lot of them kind of not necessarily freaked out, but definitely a little bit anxious and a little bit uncertain of it. So uh, you now never you know. know that, that breed test that we were talking about a second ago, they actually have a test like that in the testing where they put down a piece of plastic. Yep. And the dogs have to walk across that. So you in effect were testing the same thing. Yep. Yep. And like when we're in one of our uh, in one of our group classes, we have a, a tub that we fill with water bottles. So it's kind of like that crackling and it's uneven surfaces and so forth. Uh, a lot of dogs, that's obviously a really, really new thing for them. But if you imagine if you're out walking in, in any, any type of environment, you might be walking on concrete one moment and the next thing you're on grass and the next thing you're on beach sand and the next moment you're on uh, um, a maybe a, a moving surface. And all of those things are, are really, really new for dogs because they uh, do they do you think that they just have more sensation in their feet no, it's just something that's unusual to them i know that a lot of times in when we train dogs for the bomb squad um and for for narcotic detection um, a lot of times i worked in, in areas where we had to search like uh, account uh, i'm sorry what's it um, um like construction sites and uh, mechanical areas uh, power stations um, and every we went into those places. They had like a mesh, like a steel mesh yep. walkway, and like our dogs cattle. used to freak out. And to be honest, I freaked out because uh, it was up at um, at Lake Tahoe. I had to search a, an area up there, and I was up about five floors high, walking on this mesh floor. And I have a thing about heights, and it was all I could do to just focus on myself. And my dog was just cruising along; he didn't care at all. That was uh, that was easy, by the way. Um, and and I remember when you went to um, you went to a uh, event in Vegas and you brought one of our dogs yeah. <laughs> and he had to go up an escalator and and that's so forth right. and that's obviously it's a moving surface it's a different type of sensation there's a lot happy. of a different environment that was there. that was Jedi that was one of my Belgian no, that was, Karnak. was it Karnak yeah it was, well um, you did it with Ludwig first yeah, and Ludwig he was, was fine, fine. He and care. then and then with Karnak Karnak was a lot more anxious yeah, he was typical Malinois very uh, hyper very high strung he was very anxious going up and yep. down escalators he's nails would dig into the into the escalator itself and so that evening at about one in the morning i went back out again and i spent about two hours literally riding up and down every escalator i could find and the security people actually saw me on camera doing it and came to find out what the heck is going on with this guy that's riding up yep. and down escalators at night but Anyway, they were fine. Uh, I was working with them as well at the same time. Or even time, so. elevators and so um, forth. And I know we're completely off, tra uh, off topic of well, socialization Well, it is part of socialization. It's, it's, it's acclimatize, yeah. acclimat to acclimate, your, acclimate your dog yeah. to strange surfaces and so forth. Um, let's talk about uh, something that you know, you've got in our notes, and I know you're going to post this as well. Um, hitting the pet shop, hitting a dog park, going to places with your dog to socialize them. So this is something that's really near and dear to my heart. The first thing is, 
If you go to a location to socialize your dog, please make sure that it's a location that has some kind of control over what their dogs are doing there. Um, I've been in places like certain, like the Home Depots and so forth, Pet Smarts, where the people bring their dogs in, they're absolutely out of control, they're mean, they're territorial, aggressive. That is not the place you want to take your dog. And if you do take your dog there, then make sure that they are not exposed to those particular dogs. Socialization with a dog that is reactive, so if your dog is fine and the other dog's reactive, that'll actually hurt your socialization and create a negative association in your dog's mind. And then the next time you go there, your dog will be looking for that other dog and thinking that something is wrong. So dog parks, same thing. If you go to a dog park, I'm not a big fan of dog parks because I just have no idea what I'm going to run into that day. Um, but if you do take your dog there, maybe stay on the outside of the fence area, let your dog get used to seeing all the other dogs running around, but don't necessarily interact with them. Uh, the famous story of dog parks is, you know, people just let their dogs all free, which is which is fine because most of those dogs do get along. But then we'll have a dog that will come along and be reactive. And then they'll say, well, that's the dogs learning to sort out their pack instinct. Well, that's nonsense. We don't want to have a dog fight um, and then turn around and, and uh, you know, have to try and get into fixing those yep. types of problem problems in our dogs later on. Um, and, and I know we kind of skipped over. So what happens if you do have a dog that is reactive and you need to go ahead and address those types of problems and those behaviors? Because actually literally not even five minutes before this, and it's kind of funny because I was, uh, it's been a long day and I was a little distracted and I was kind of just sitting on the ch couch chilling, I would say 10 minutes before we were supposed to start this live show. And he comes walking down, he's like, all right, you ready to go? I'm like, ready to go for what? And he's like, the show. I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, we got five minutes till we're starting. I was like, oh, shh. yeah. Curse Pan words were pandemonium. Yeah. So, but, but, but we got it up in, in time. But um, what I, I was uh, actually at the exact time I was messaging someone who had written to us on our website and uh, one of their, you know, things that they're wanting to work on is that they, their dog is, you know, aggressive and reactive towards other dogs. And they basically want to do a group class or some type of um, class environment to address those types of issues. Um, one of our programs here, if you don't know much about us, is, is board and train. So we basically um, like camp programs where you drop your dog off for a period of time, usually two to three weeks, and then we address any type of behaviors or any type of things that you're wanting to work on in those environments. And that's usually where behavioral issues such as reactivity is, is ideal. Um, but when we had so so this person was wanting to do group classes because they don't want to leave their dog for two to three weeks at a time, which is understandable. Like a lot, that's probably a huge complaint, um, or not really complaint, but objection that uh, a lot of parents have is that they don't want to be away from their their children for you know two to three weeks at a time, which we definitely understand. The thing we usually say is that it's two to three weeks out of the dogs 10 12 14 15 years that they're going to be alive and it's better to kind of get that training that they need so that they can live a happier life throughout the rest of their time with uh with you know with their family so the reason why so when i said to her is like hey you know group classes are not going to be a good environment to address those types of issues and a because you're not really being able to work one-on-one -on -one with a trainer you have usually have one trainer for about eight or so students and so a trainer can't address your dog's reactivity in that class environment and b because it's only once a week for maybe an hour at a time and then typically it relies on you being able to do your homework and so it's really really inconsistent and you can't make any type of progress dogs work best in terms of breaking down a behavior when you can address it every single day for an hour to an hour and a half a day and then even more probably four to five hours a day addressing those types of issues, addressing that reactivity and really, really nailing it down and then building back up the positives that you want to do. Um, so that's what we do when we bring a dog here for one of our board and train programs is that we start with building up a foundational type of obedience because usually that's lacking. So making sure that the dog, that we have tools, that the dog listens to us uh, no matter what type of environment they're in. And then they we start progressively adding in some more distractions, some more triggers, which in this case, a trigger is another dog entering in their environment. And basically every single moment that they pay any attention to that dog or that they start to show those increases in state of arousal, so for instance, if you're working in a quiet environment, nothing going on around, your dog's listening to you well, you might be at a level eight and a level maybe two or three in state of arousal, level eight in obedience. Um, 
and then the minute a dog enters that environment, that state of arousal might go up to a six and your obedience might go down to a four. Well, you want to shift that back into the, the correct balance. And so when we're working with dogs that have that type of reactivity, we add it gradually and still maintain that level of obedience and lower and, and control that level of uh, state of arousal so that we can work through those issues. And eventually with enough redirection, enough correction, enough you know positivity built back into it, you're able to at least be able to manage those behaviors in those certain situations. Now, you might never have a dog that goes and wants to play with other dogs and is completely fine with them. You might, but you most likely will have to always manage and, and control that behavior. Just like, you know, we, we don't love using the... Um, uh, yeah, we don't love using the analogy, but just like someone that might be going through rehab, they might not ever be able to be in environments where they might, you know, that might trigger a, a um, uh, falling off the wagon, but you're at least able to manage that uh, addiction in certain situations. And so it's kind of similar with dogs where you might not ever be able to put them in a certain situation that would have triggered it, but you can at least have a, a better control and your dog can live a happier life without having to worry every single time you go out on a walk. All right. Anything you want to add to that? Nope. No. Nope. So we good. So a little bit of a shorter show today. What we're going to do is this is going to be what we call our socialization series. Um, it's going to be pretty similar in terms of, you know, you address these types of problems in pretty similar ways, but it might be a little bit different in terms of how you approach it with different types of socialization. Um, this first part is obviously socialization with other dogs. Next week, we're going to do socialization with humans. So that might be men, it might be children, yep. it might be That's a big problem uh, with dogs families. that uh, come up against. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have got dogs that are reactive towards men. Uh, sometimes you'll see it when they're reactive towards like landscapers or movers or people that come into the home and so forth. If you're having those kinds of problems, then make sure you tune in next week, next Wednesday. Uh, I will be back from Mexico because tomorrow morning I'm headed to Mexico for a little bit of R&R, yep. &R, much needed R&R, &R, but I'll be back by next week and, uh, and we'll be talking about that. And something else I want to ask you guys, and I hope that uh, there's enough, yeah, there's a whole bunch of you guys still listening, you know, give us some feedback of what you enjoy, what you want us to talk about. Do you want us to give you more stories or do you want us to talk more about behavior or talk more about training? You know, obviously this is your show and we're guided by you guys and we really want your input. Yep. Uh, so don't feel shy to ask us questions. If you don't ask questions, then I obviously we won't know what to talk about. So, uh, and yep. we're more than happy to help out. Uh, it's really cool. We see that, uh, go back to that list that you had there. Uh, we've got uh, quite a few guys. John is still with us. And John's always with us. So when you do a watch party on your personal page, people join that, but that doesn't add to this live. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a pity. Uh, David Fraser is on with us. Rick Panu's is on with us. Uh, Nick is on with us. And uh, as I said, John Lynn is always around. Uh, we really appreciate you guys signing in or yep. uh, taking up the time, taking some time to and of course, with us. Remember, you can always listen to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You can go on YouTube. You can go to heyludwig.com slash the, Us or, I'm sorry, yeah, the Ustazen Show uh, and be able to view it there. There's also a bunch of links in the description where you can view all the different um, uh, places where you can listen yep. to or, or watch it. Again. And now that Arizona has a new law that says you can't text and drive, that means no more Facebooking, no more Instagramming while you're driving, Christopher. You uh, do no it more just texting. as much as me. So that's that's you know very high and mighty to cast no, that stone. No more texting and driving. So now you guys have got more time to listen to podcasts. Just there make you sure that you dial in. It's got to be hands-free. Uh, that's what the new law says. Yeah, so then that, um, that's a really good question. So if you are just changing the song or changing your podcast or if you're looking at a map, then obviously you're using your phone. So how do they measure, like how do they change that? Well, they say it's got to be hands-free. So therefore you can't have your phone in your hand. So you've got to put your phone up on the dash or in some kind of a holder. And obviously if you're changing something or if you're touching something, I guess you could Which do that. Which is funny because I can interact with it better and still keep my eyes on the road better here than if I'm over here yeah, like that, that, touching it. That point was made by quite a few people. But anyway, we don't write the laws. We just follow well, and them. It's only, they only start ticketing you past 2021. Yeah, don't, it's don't a warning until game. then. It's a warning till then. It's a but warning trust until me, then. You don't want to get pulled over because that's when they start getting into uh, all the other things. So uh, make sure you uh, put it into your phone before you get in the car. And that way when you get in, you can listen to our podcast. Yep, 30 and minutes. Can, uh, we usually do 30 to 45 minutes. It's pretty much a perfect uh, drive. I mean, that's pretty much one direction yep. usually. And shoot us a note. Let us know what you want to talk about next time. Yep. So all we'll right. see you guys next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time for socialization with other people. Um, and we'll see you guys then. Thanks for watching.